not that complicated to talk about. It's really hard to do. Thing one, you have to be motivated. You have to want it. You have to say, I've got to learn. I've got to get better. That is a hard thing to do because most of us at most point in time think we're pretty good. We think we're pretty good. But we're not pretty good. We're just what we are. So how do you get 5% better? How do you get 10% better? If you can get 5 or 10% better every year, say it's 7%. You basically double your impact on whatever me metrics you're thinking about in 10 years. So how can you double your impact? The metric I use at BridgeSpan, which is, I don't use it literally, but I use it as a way of thinking about what I'm doing, is sustainable social impact per day. Sustainable meaning I want it to be around for a while, social impact defined in a certain way per day as a measure of productivity. So that's kind of left brainish but it gives me a marker. So motivation number one, or, or issue number one around self-development, is you have to want it, you have to have an open mind. The open mind is important because you don't get better without feedback. You just don't. <laughs> Athletes don't get better without coaches, and game films, and all the other stuff. You know, people who teach don't get better without feedback. All of us need feedback. Now here's the problem with feedback. There are a bunch of problems. The first problem is the kind of feedback you like is positive feedback. We like positive feedback. You got an A. I'm so cool. I'm smart. You did a great job. Positive feedback is cheap. The half-life of positive feedback is what? A week? A day? If you're generally you know, sort of an insecure overachiever type, which I'm guessing most of you are, <laughs> the half-life of positive feedback can be measured in seconds, moments. You may not even hear it. <laughs> I got the A, but what about the next test? <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I know I did great on that project, but what about the next one? Oh my God, I might fail. Right? That's how it feels. So positive feedback, it's kind of like, you know, an air sandwich. There's just not much in the middle sometimes. It's not, it can feel good, but it doesn't always add much value. Negative feedback is where the value's added. Constructive negative feedback. Constructive meaning it's right, it's useful, and it's corrective. Now the thing about constructive negative feedback is we don't like it. It hurts. It hurts. When I was running the San Francisco office, when it was on the upturn before it went on the downturn, I'm sitting there in my office and I, had a, I was so cool. I was, I think, 29 years old, running the third largest office at Bain. I've got this big panoramic view of the San Francisco Bay, 34th floor of the Embarcadero Center, Tower One, just phenomenal. And this young partner comes into my office. Now, your brain's sitting there thinking, okay, why are you coming into my office? I'm busy. And she comes in. I say, you know, you have an open door policy. You're not supposed to walk through the open door. Come on now. <laughs> so she comes in and says, can we talk? And my brain's thinking, my face is saying, yeah, of course. My brain's thinking, I'm being interrupted. I got things to do. I'm an important guy. What do you want to talk about? So she says, I'd like to give you some feedback. And your face says, sure, I want feedback. Your brain says, give me a break. I don't want, I'm running the office. You're a baby partner. Don't give me, I don't want feedback from you. I said, tell me about it. So she goes to the it was a flip chart that I had in the office, and draws something like, and I won't, I won't do the art justice, but it was something extravagant like that. And it looks like a kind of, I don't know, a truck or a train or a piece of equipment. She said, you're a steamroller. Now, the brain says, well, that's cool. It's big. It's effective. It's <laughs> <laughs> she says, you're rolling over people. You're rolling over people. You are steamrolling people. It's your way of the highway. You're, you're controlling. You're over controlling. My little project management skills that I said I was pretty good at, you know, taking to the extreme. Do this, do this, you go left, you go right, blah, blah, blah. That's not how you build great teams or great organizations. And I have a part of that in me. You're steamrolling people. Brain says, go away. Then brain says, well, maybe she's right. The next day I went home, slept on it, decided she's right, absolutely right. Came back the next day, talked to her, said thank you very much for that negative feedback. It was a gift. I still remember it. This is a long time ago. That was Meg Whitman, COV Bay. <laughs> Pivotal moment. Took a lot of courage for her. Not a natural act. Not a natural act. 
Feedback like that is a gift. It doesn't always feel good, but it is a gift. When I took over Bain, I asked for upward feedback. I would kind of instituted 360 degree feedback out in San Francisco, something called skip level interviews. So somebody would interview your direct reports and then take it to your boss. So I had people interviewing my direct reports, the feedback going to Bill Bain when I was running the office. Which, and I felt I had to role model that because that allowed me then to do the same thing for the people who were working with me, my partners. So all of a sudden I'm running the company, I'm managing partner, I'm back in Boston, I say, okay, I gotta have feedback. And Bill Bain never had feedback, believe me. So all of a sudden I need a feedback loop. I asked my executive committee, the policy committee it was called then, to uh, please interview people. So they put a little committee together and they interviewed 30 or 40 partners. And they came back and I still remember this vividly. They sat me down in a little conference room, three of them, one of me. And they had this document. And the document was typed up document, I don't know, 10, 12 pages. And they all looked pretty serious. And I had had a great year. I mean, the firm, I sort of, I'd arrest, the firm had been declining. The revenue had started to go like this a little bit. And I'd been able to retain some people that I really needed to retain. And <coughs> the place was a mess. And I really felt like I was making great progress at a huge personal cost. It's one of those, you know, battlefield kind of situations. I was feeling great. It was the end of the year. They started and they say, you know what? Um, partners really appreciate what you're doing. They know you're working hard. So that's a good place to start, I'm thinking. And, sentence two, they think there's a lot of things you could do better. Do better? I'm a star. This is great. You're lucky to have me here. What are you talking about? <laughs> it turned out in the document there was one nice little paragraph up front and the rest of the document, all the rest of those pages, were things I was supposed to do better. And I sat there, I would rather go to the dentist and have three root canals than do that again. I sat there, these are all people, I set their compensation. Okay, this is the committee giving the managing partner feedback. I sat there and took this. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to be nice and, and inside I'm exploding. I'm exploding. I get home, Karen, my wonderful wife Karen, I said, Karen, you wouldn't believe what happened today. I pour myself a little scotch, go outside, try to chill. Let her, I said, you gotta read this, you gotta read this crap. You won't believe it. You won't believe what they did to me. I'm working so hard. You wouldn't believe what they did to me. Finish my scotch, go and get a second scotch, go back outside. <laughs> <laughs> Karen eventually comes out having read this, and I, and I said, you know, sweetie, I mean, what do you think? I mean, what do you think about this? She said, well, I actually think it's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pivotal moments. Pivotal moments. Our inclination is to reject the constructive negative feedback it is exactly what we need. It isn't necessarily true that every bit's right, but if you collect it from different camera angles, if you get both the formal feedback, that's the performance review stuff, and the informal on the job Meg Whitman type feedback, pretty soon you start to get a sense for what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and what you need to really develop. You build on your strengths. Always build on your strengths. Don't build on the strengths you wish you had. Build on the strengths you know you have. I was a good project manager. I knew I was good at that. I was not a good sort of senior executive cocktail party networking person. I had no clue how to do that. So build on those strengths. Eventually you can extend those strengths. Hugely important to develop yourself with not just feedback, but over time keeping data. So I go away every year, take two or three days at the end of the year, write up well, how did the year go, what did I learn, what mistakes did I make, what would I do differently, what do I want to be five years from now, what do I want to be ten years from now. This isn't a left brain engineering kind of PERT chart. This is me giving myself feedback in the context of data. This is enormously important if you ever want to balance your life across different sectors. If you don't know how many days you're traveling, how many nights you're away from home, if you don't know what's causing that. How are you going to ever address it? If you don't know what the bottom 20% of your activities are, the bottom, the 20% that you're really wasting. I told a group of executives yesterday, I could follow any executive around, I think, for uh, two or three months and find 20% of the time that they're just wasting. We all do it, but we don't know we do it. And, and the only way to know we do it is to both learn from the feedback formal and informal, and have some sources of data. So, most important point, if you're going to achieve success on whatever dimensions you want to achieve, you have to commit yourself to continuous improvement. Nobody is going to do that except you. 
No organization is going to say it's really important to me, the organization, that you get better and better over the next 30 years of your life. No, that's self-imposed. You set your own standard of excellence. Second dimension of that is in strategy, the essence of strategy, some would say, is resource allocation. It's how you allocate scarce resources, capital. For us as individuals, it's how you allocate your scarce resource, which is time. And my life just got shorter somehow, <laughs> this chalk. <laughs> I need to find different chalk. Uh, in fact, I, I'm going to extend my life right now. <sighs> you only have so much time. Any given day, any given week, any given year in your lifetimes. Hopefully they're long and prosperous and healthy lifetimes. You allocate that either in a disciplined kind of way, thinking, you know, this is really important, or you let the world allocate it for you. Any job any of you have will absorb 24-7 every moment you can give it. The job will not say, okay, you're doing too much work, you got to cut back. The job will not say that. You might end up with a compassionate boss or a thoughtful boss or a great leader who will tell you, hey, back off, take that vacation, but the job will not put a governor on you. If you ever have kids, some of you that are blessed with kids, you know, a three-year-old will not tell you, mommy, daddy, I really need a greater share of time, of mind. I, you know, you're just not, I'm not, I'm not a, big a, piece of, a big enough piece of your portfolio. They're not going to tell you that. Because if dad's only there once a month, that's their normal. Dad's there once a month. Some kids' normal is they don't have dads. Or mom, I see mom, you know, on Saturday nights. You know, that's their normal. They're not going to give you the feedback. You have to think about how you're spending your time. It's your most precious resource. It, you can waste a lot of it. A lot of us waste time. The only way you're going to improve your, if you will, productivity and in the context of whatever it is you're trying to achieve with your life, what you, how you define success, is to be highly disciplined to know where to say no. To know where to say no. We're not trained to say no. We're trained to say, sure, I'll do that. I'll take that test. I'll take that job. Can do, can do attitude. In life, you have to say, can't do, won't do, not right for me. In the same context, you've got different dimensions to your life. So sometimes we think pretty rigorously about how we deal with the work dimension and how we're spending our time. We get feedback on that. We don't think about how we're doing with the other dimensions that Stu writes about, with the community, or with family, or with self. You know when you get on the airplanes and they, they have that little uh, drill about if we get into trouble, these masks come down, what do they say? They say put your mask on first. They say put your mask on first because if you're not taking care of yourself, there is no way you're going to take care of other people. The exact same true is here. If you're not taking care of yourself, you can't take care of other people. If you are not keeping yourself healthy, there is no way you are going to achieve some of this stuff, period. It just doesn't happen. Not in this context. You know, three cheeseburgers a day for 30 years, you got a problem. No exercise for five years, you got a problem. I mean, it's just a problem. You can decide you want to make those trade offs, but make them explicit. Don't let kind of momentum and circumstances make them for you. Productivity, bucket two. Bucket three, leadership. An awful lot of what people accomplish in life has nothing to do directly with them. I would say, phew, three quarters of what I could claim I've, quote, accomplished was really about other people, not me, maybe 80%. Now, leadership is often confused with span of control, so I'm leading these five people. It's the 10,000 people report to me thing. That's not the key issue. The key issue is span of influence. It's who can you influence? And it's not just the people who are on some organizational chart in proximity to you. It's the people who matter to you inside an organization, outside an organization, multiple levels. What's your span of influence? Who's in that span of influence? How many people can you influence? What is influence? What is leadership? Well, in a way, leadership is influencing people to do things they wouldn't necessarily do <coughs> in order to achieve some goal. So motivating people to work harder or work together or work in different ways to achieve a goal. If they would do it automatically, you're not adding much value. So it's helping create value that wouldn't be created without leadership. You do that through influence. You do that through personal relationships. What's a strong personal relationship? What are the characteristics of a strong personal relationship? I think three things. Three things. If you don't have those three ingredients, it's hard to have a relationship of influence. It's trust, it's respect, and it's caring. If somebody doesn't trust you, you'll know that. 
Will that person influence you? Not as much. How about somebody trusts you but they don't respect you? Say, so I trust the guy, he's just an idiot. Can I influence you a lot? No, I don't think so. How about caring? You know, I trust my respect, but I don't really give a hoot. Influential? Uh-uh. You think about the best relationships in your life. It's about, it's based on trust and respect, mutual trust, mutual respect, mutual caring. That's where you get people. And you know what the implication of that is? Which is really hard for us, especially when we're operating off of somebody else's scorecard. It's not about me. It's not about me. Someone asked in, her, in the class earlier, how do you influence people that are older than you or different than you or somehow? By helping them, by being focused on them, by asking them questions about themselves. <laughs> it's not about you. So how are you doing and really meaning it? What can I do to help? If people have the idea that your motive is all about you, how do they react? It's like somebody selling somebody something. If the motive is, hey, I care about you, what can I do to help? Let's collaborate. It's open. It's honest. It's direct. That's how you influence people. And it ends up being all about relationships, the networks of relationship you have in helping other people succeed. I was interviewed one time about, uh, by a reporter when I was running Bain. And they said, how do you, what, tell me what your job description is. I said, my job description is help other people succeed in the context of our strategy. That's my job description. That's all I try to do. I try to create the environment where really outstanding people can succeed at Bain & Company. I want to help clients succeed. That's my job. My job is other people's success. And I'll tell you what, if you approach things that way, you wouldn't believe the dividends. Now, it has to be authentic. You can't do this and be a phony. People will see through that in a heartbeat. You have to be authentic. You have to say, this is me. And people will do it different ways. The left brain among us will be more analytic about it. The right brain among us will be more passionate and emotional about it. Whatever style is your style. But this issue of leading through influence, of building relationships, compounds itself over time. It compounds itself. The magic of compounding, if you start building relationships and people say, you know, what a great person, that will come back to you in ways you'll never know. You know, people always say, you know, it's not, it's not what you have or what you do, it's who you know. That's not exactly true. It's who knows you. And it's what they think about you. If a lot of people know you and they think you're a jerk, turns out that's not the best solution. <laughs> that's not the best approach. So, self-development, productivity, leadership. Let me wrap up on, uh, by, by saying um, a little bit about success over here. We've touched on this notion that it's your scorecard, not somebody else's scorecard, and that there's going to be ups and downs. And you kind of, kind of keep hitting the reset button asking what matters and how am I thinking about it. You have different phases in this context. There are life phases that matter. So for example, when all of you leave here, you start your job, you, your first or second year in a new job is not the time to try to maximize life balance. You know, be practical. You've got to prove yourself. You've got to do your job. It doesn't mean you have to throw it out the window, but you go through different phases of life when you can pull full throttle on one dimension and pull back on another dimension. When you're in those different phases, thinking a few steps ahead matters a lot. There was conventional wisdom, I don't know if it still exists today, that life itself would be in three phases. And when I grew up, it was learn, earn, and serve. And this simple-minded idea was, well, you're going to learn, you're going to be in school, and you're going to learn. Then you're going to leave school, and you're going to earn. Then you're going to serve. Now at that time, you know, when this, this idea sort of percolated up, the, the, you know, the people worked till 65 and then kind of retired and that was that. So in fact, what happened was, the, I mean, a cynic would say, okay, I'm learning and then as soon as I start earning, I stop learning. And my earning is all about earning money. And then my serving part comes in the last five years of my life when I'm too burned out to serve. That's stupid. You don't learn. You're always learning. I hope, I hope you're always learning. Remember, continuous improvement. I hope you're, you're always earning. It might come in different forms, monetary or not monetary, and always serving. Because if you start thinking about you know, learning and earning and serving, and you think about those different dimensions of family and self and community and work, and you start thinking about that over time, that gets to be a pretty rich concoction, <coughs> pretty interesting customized to you. So there you have 
How to Succeed at Life in Bain, and a few headlines. And now let me open up for whatever questions are relevant to all of you guys. Thanks. Sure. You talked about, you know, just this process of continuum improvement. How do you draw the line between that and, like, perfectionism and, and, you know, being able to say, I've done a good job, like, this is good, and, you know, move forward from there? That's a great question. So, continuous improvement, how do you draw the line? What's, you know, the best answer to that, is, is the general answer, is to be very explicit about what you're trying to do. So, here's an illustration. Um, I decided early on that I wanted to be, you know, as best as I could, a really good presenter. I also decided earlier on that I was never going to be very good in social settings. I, I just, I wasn't going to be the kind of person that would initiate new client relationships. I just wasn't, I'm, I'm okay at it now, but I wasn't going to be good at that. So I set those bars differently. And what that meant on the social settings is I actually didn't put myself in those settings very much. I didn't sign up to be the, the kind of new client initiator, let's go out to dinner and have a beer. I just, I, it was, I, I guess I lacked the confidence. I didn't know, I just had no model. I didn't have any clue how to do that. So I knew I wasn't going to excel on that. That was not going to be a strength. I just wanted to be good enough. On the presentation skills, I wanted to be exemplary as best as I could. And so on that dimension, I hired a coach. <laughs> I went through every bane, every possible thing I could figure about how to give speeches, how to talk. I did videotapes, basically my own game films, for years and years and years and years. And every chance I got to give a talk to anybody, anybody. I remember giving a presentation to my parents. Was, you know, anybody, sit still long enough, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you <laughs> about something. And, and I nurtured that skill. So part of it is being very disciplined about what, you, what, you, what are the strengths you want to build on and what are the other things that you want to kind of cut short. Question over here. Question over here. Do you think there's diamonds in every rough? And what I mean by that is when you get through a list of the partners that are, that are below you and like the, the number 25th partner, do you look at that number 25th and say, this guy could, could be a superstar in the future? Uh, are there diamonds in every rough? Yes and no. What I mean by that is all of us are different. All of us have our different profiles. All, you, no two of you answer the success question exactly the same. So you have different scorecards over time. What that means is that everybody's, uh, my view, everybody is a diamond, rough or not. But not necessarily does that diamond belong in any given piece of jewelry. I don't carry the metaphor too far. So what I mean, uh, therefore, is figuring out what you're naturally good at, what your gifts are, making sure those are in the right spot. So is everybody a diamond in the rough to be a you know, consulting partner? No. No. Other people maybe, maybe should be general managers or, or uh, public servants of some kind. So, and so, so understanding that about yourself is hugely important. What, what happens oftentimes with institutions like this, and it's, not, it's no fault of, of business school, is we all kind of end up in the mode of building a resume, not building a life. <laughs> and building a resume is easier than building a life because you don't have to think about these hard trade-offs. You know, building a resume is, boy, I've got to get a good job, I've got to go to Bain, then I've got to do this, then I've got to do that. It, it, building a life is what am I really good at? What's my calling, if you will? How do I build on that? Yes, sir. Uh, in the reading, you talked about if you're too comfortable in a different setting, something, you should change something. And in the case of Aragorn, it seemed like it was by design, your design. But over there, you make it seem like it was uh, downturns in life, they have to get out of it. Um, Drucker has this great phrase, and uh, Peter Drucker, and I will, I will not do it justice, but it's, it's something like, you know, life is what happens to you when you're planning for other outcomes. And the, the gist of that notion is, one hand, it is really important to be as thoughtful as you can about your s definition of success at whatever phase, planting seeds for future, you know, and kind of knowing the trade-offs you want to make, having that framework. But then at the same time, life happens. And, and this story is a combination of those things. If anyone had told me I was going to be chief executive of Bain when I joined, I would have said they were just crazy. I wasn't going to stay in consulting. I knew I wanted to do general management. And I wasn't going to stay at Bain if I couldn't be some sort of a general manager sooner or later. But the probability of that happening was low. So you have to be opportunistic. 
but you can't be opportunistic unless you, you're pretty sure that's what you want to do. I'll give a, a Meg Whitman uh, story. She and I are talking about this. You know, she just stepped down as chief executive. April, uh, March 31st was her last day. So I was, I was with her out there at the offices that day, and we were talking about how she ended up at eBay. Because she had gone from Bain, she was a partner in San Francisco office, you know, very successful, went to Disney, then went to Stride Right, had a quick uh, spin at FTD, which is a Bain Capital Company, for a while, then ended up at uh, Hasbro Toys, gets a call from Bob Cagle, who's a venture capitalist out in California, saying, why don't you come out and look at this, per this company has 18 people. So you gotta be kidding me. 18 people, little internet company? run by this guy, kind of Piero Midiar, he's got really long hair and the site's black and white and it's kind of weird, and it's some auction thing. Well, a, a person that had not been thoughtful about where they were going and what their strengths and weaknesses are would have said, forget it. I mean, I'm an executive at Hasbro, I might be chief executive of a company like this someday, this is a nothing, this is a nothing. She went out there knowing herself, knowing what she was good at, knowing what she kind of wanted to do with her life, and came home and told her husband Griff, who is a brain surgeon, I mean, a, literally a brain surgeon, and was a senior uh, guy at Harvard Medical School, we gotta move. <sighs> you gotta be kidding me. So he luckily got, he ran the, ran the program out at Stanford now. But th there's the, the, the dual, t being opportunistic, but having that opportunistic decision making grounded in who you are and what you're trying to do, that's the, that's the I think, the best practice. Over here someplace, yes. How far ahead should you know, one typically plan? I mean, you showed us how life should be viewed and you know, for chalk. And isn't it hard to stick to your goals, especially in setting like, for me, in a, in a setting you know, of the company that I keep right now, one does get influenced by goals and aspirations that everyone has, and that seems to influence you know, my individual goals and aspirations. So you know, how far ahead should someone like that? So how far ahead should someone plan? Let, maybe let me rephrase the word planning from kind of reflecting. Because again, you know, life is what happens to you when you're planning. Or there's a, there's a saying, I think it's the Marines that have it, the, the uh, uh, plan for battle lasts only until the enemy is engaged. Because then stuff happens. The value is in thinking through it. And so thinking through your life scorecard. You know, people will, will give, do these exercises, write my life's epitaph. You know, I'm not saying you have to do that every year, but thinking about what matters in your life. One of the things that coincided, and this was highly intentional on my part with Bridgespan, was I had two kids. The oldest was uh, just uh, in middle school, and the youngest was coming up. And that's prime time. That's kid prime time. <laughs> sort of age 11, 12-ish to uh, you know, 16 when they can drive and, uh, and really start paying attention to other people. <laughs> then that zone is prime time. And I, no, I thought about that a lot. I thought, geez, so I want to be in this crazy job, at least if it's a nonprofit, it'll be smaller and I won't have to be, I won't, it'll be domestic, not international. So there's an issue with just planning ahead, thinking about the phases, thinking about planting seeds. You know, I wrote the first, in my journal, the first